chapter 5, beginning at verse 12 and uh, reading to verse 16. Luke writes, It happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. Then the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. This uh, miracle that we're going to be looking at, this cleansing of the leper, is found in Mark chapter 1 as well as Matthew chapter 8. It's repeated in other Gospels, and uh, we'll be looking at it here in Luke chapter 5. Now, what we're looking at is the cleansing of a leper. Now, leprosy was regarded as a disease during the Lord Jesus Christ's time, a disease with moral implications. It was the most feared disease in the ancient world during the time of Christ because it was recognized as being incurable. In the Old Testament, the, uh, the Bible actually in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, actually gives us specific commands that relate to this particular disease. And among the 61 defilements in ancient Judaism, it was second only to the touching of a dead body. Leprosy was a, a very serious disease, and, and so the Old Testament states that when leprosy is present, that a leper was to do certain things. If you take notes, Leviticus 13, verses 45 and 46 tells us what the leper is to do. It says that the, the person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothing, because that's a symbol of mourning. They must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. So leprosy in the nation of Israel is actually a symbol, a symbol of sin. And lepers were rejected because of that. Now, it was a good symbol of sin because, like sin, it infects the entire person. It's ugly. It corrupts. It contaminates. It alienates. And it's incurable outside of a touch from God. The rabbis during that day knew of no prayer or offering or a ritual that could cleanse a leper. They knew that only God was the one who cleansed the leper. Now, there's a writer by the name of Heisinger, and he wrote a book called Unclean, Unclean. And this is how he describes leprosy. He said, leprosy generally begins with pain in certain areas of the body. Numbness follows. Soon the skin in such spots loses its original color. It gets thick, glossy, and scaly. As the sickness progresses, the thickened spots become dirty sores and ulcers due to poor blood supply. The skin, especially around the eyes and ears, begins to bunch with deep furrows between the swellings so that the face of the afflicted individual uh, loses all form and comeliness. And so this person who had leprosy was an outcast. Now, some of the rabbis were very harsh towards lepers. They treated them unkindly. Some said that no less than six feet must be kept from a leper, and a hundred feet is not sufficient in strong wind. Some rabbis even threw stones at them. Others would hide themselves when they heard the words, unclean, unclean. Now, I say all of that to give you a background, because this leper is doing something that is unheard of. He's approaching somebody He's approaching Jesus Christ. Notice what it says in verse 12 again. It happened when he was in a certain city. Behold, he says, behold, a man who was full of leprosy. He says, behold, because this is unusual. A man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, I want you to see something. This is extraordinary, because normally when he saw a rabbi like Jesus walking down the street, he would have run away. You see, Moses nor Elijah ever healed a leper. But this is a man who believed that Jesus Christ could do something. And notice what he says. 
He says in verse 12, you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, he knew that Jesus had power. He obviously had heard about this rabbi named Jesus, but he didn't know if Jesus would use his power. We need to remember that God's will must never be confused with God's power. God has all power, but his power always is operating through his will. And so this man knows that Jesus Christ has the ability, but he also knows that he has to trust in his will. Is he willing to reach out and do something on my behalf? Now, there are four basic things that we can learn from this man that I think will help us in our own Christian lives. Four things that we can learn from him. One, we know that he senses a willingness on the part of Jesus to be near him and not reject him. We know that he's willing to be near this man. This man sensed that Jesus Christ was not like other people. This is a man who sensed that Jesus Christ was not going to reject him. That is, that Jesus was somebody that he could approach. Uh, Jesus is the kind of person that he can have fellowship with. This is the kind of man who isn't going to throw rocks at him, isn't going to hide from him, isn't going to reject him. And that's an important thing for us to understand, that Jesus Christ has come in order that he might have relationship with us. It's an interesting story found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. It's a place where the Lord Jesus Christ is seated amongst people who are regarded as sinners and, and, uh, and um, unclean, uh, spiritually unclean people. And, and in that particular passage of Scripture, there, uh, there are people who are making an accusation concerning Jesus Christ because he eats with, with these people and all. And, and Jesus makes a statement. He said, the Son of Man didn't come to save uh, the righteous. He said, but sinners. Jesus, in other words, a friend of sinners, has come to minister to sinners. He was a friend of sinners then, and by way of application, he's a friend of sinners now. So one, he senses a willingness on the part of the Lord to be near and not to reject him. Second, we notice that he humbles himself. He bows before the Lord Jesus Christ, even calls him Lord. And so we see in his humility that God is going to move. In Proverbs 3.34, the Bible says, Surely God scorns scorners, but gives grace to the lowly. A third thing we see about him is that he's willing to submit himself to the will of God. Now, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, John said, This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And so that's why he said, If you are willing, you can make me clean. He submits himself to the will of God, and then finally, he places his faith in him. He says to him, I know that you can make me clean. And so he goes to the one who will not reject him. He humbles himself, shows him respect and reverence. He knows that Jesus Christ is, is capable of doing something. He now prays that Jesus is willing. Now notice verse 13, what Jesus does. He put out his hand and he touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. This was forbidden by the law of Moses. It was forbidden to touch a leper. You were not to reach out and touch somebody like that. In Leviticus chapter 5, verse 3, the Bible says if he touches human uncleanness, anything that would make him unclean, even, though he's, even if he's unaware of it, uh, when he learns of it, he will be guilty. So when the Lord Jesus Christ actually reaches out to touch this man, he's doing something that is really uh, just an amazing thing. Now, I want you to see how Jesus reaches out and physically touches this man. And the way that he touches him is, is gentle, and it's loving, and it is compassionate. If there's anything that you can walk out of this room tonight knowing about the Lord Jesus Christ is that he is a gentle, loving, and compassionate man. He was the kind of person and is the kind of person that you could get to know very easily if you want to. He's the kind of person that if you were all alone in a house, and though there's a group of people present also, that when the Lord Jesus Christ walked in and would look at you, you would not be threatened by him, but actually would be attracted to him because though he would be the most incredibly popular person in that room, he would treat you like you mattered. He would treat you like you, you had value. And that's what the Lord does. The Lord causes you to realize that you have value. He loved this man. He loved this rejected man. That's something for us to learn from. You see, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53, verses 3 and 4, 
Messiah was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Rejected by men, a man of sorrows. Jesus understood, and not only does he understand he's moving, he moves by compassion. And what he has done, he does, is he, he releases this man from his pain. Now, in order to understand, we need to remember what kind of life this man was living as a leper, because this, this leprosy was the symbol of living death, and it had to be dealt with. When Jesus reaches down and touches him, he's now being restored to community. He's being restored to sacrifice and right relationship with God. And that's what happens when the Lord reaches down and touches us. You see, at one time, we were regarded as the living dead. Though we had physical life, spiritually, we were dead. Remember, as we've been studying on Sunday mornings, the book of Ephesians, remember chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, in Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You at one time, it says, were dead in trespasses and sins. We may have had physical life, but spiritually we were dead. We have an old nature. That nature prior to us being converted was the dominant nature in our life. And by nature, we are sinners, and spiritually we are cut off from God. As leprosy has a tendency of causing isolation, even so, because of our sin, we were isolated from the Lord. But the Lord Jesus Christ reaches down and touches your life. He does that through the preaching of the Word of God, through the communication of God's Word through Bible study. He does that through the, through the communication of His ways to us as we read the Word of God and hear what He's all about. And, and so we read how the Lord Jesus Christ is a friend of sinners, and, and we're, we're told that we are sinners without Christ. We need to be forgiven. We open our hearts to Christ and say, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner, and I need a relationship with you. And when that happens... The Lord Jesus Christ, in a sense, is reaching down and touching our lives. And as he reaches and touches our lives, we who at one time were dead in trespasses and sins are now made alive by the Spirit of God who dwells within us. We cried out. We cried out to God in humility because it requires humility to be saved. You know, when I, when I give invitations here, I, I like to emphasize that. It requires humility to be saved. You know, it is true, yes, you can be seated there in the congregation and, and you can open your heart to Christ right there, but it requires a humility, a brokenness before God to say, God, be merciful to me. And when I invite you to come forward and to stand here in front of, uh, in front of many witnesses, it's because I want you to learn to walk for Jesus Christ in the open. And this is a place that is safe for you to do that. This is a place when you walk up and you say yes to Jesus, that the people here actually will applaud that decision because they want that for you, you see. But it requires humility for us to say yes to God, and it requires faith so that we might say, God, in Jesus' name, would you touch me? And that's what's happening. You see, Jesus said, I am willing, be cleansed. Now notice verse 13, immediately the leprosy left him. Verse 14, and he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. And so Jesus says, listen, you go and you make this offering because it's going to be a testimony. You find that in Leviticus chapter 14, when a leper was cleansed, he would make an offering and it would be a testimony that God had moved. And, and so he's saying, listen, seeing that you have been cleansed, be willing to have it verified. Sometimes people will say, and I see it on TV quite often, well, I've been healed of such and so disease. I don't want to doubt that God heals. I know that God does. But I believe very strongly that when God is healed, you can go to a doctor and the doctor will verify that. The doctor will say, you once had this disease and now it's gone. We've had people in this fellowship who come and shared their testimonies with me, uh, more than one person who's been healed from cancer, which to me is always an amazing thing. Anything that's being healed is a wonderful thing, but I, I come to mind cancer where they've had x-rays that have been done, and, uh, and doctors have actually uh, been amazed because they'll say, you know, this is the recent x-ray, and, and this is the old one, and this shows cancer, and, 
And this one here shows that it's gone, and we don't have an answer for this, you know. Be willing to go to the doctor. Be willing to have it verified. If the Lord has moved, it can be verified. Jesus said, go and make that offering. Why? It'll be a testimony to them. Now, it says in verse 15, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Now, Mark gives us more insight because in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, uh, Jesus had told him, say nothing to anyone but go. So Mark tells us in chapter 1 verse 45 that he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places and they came to him from every quarter. Actually what he did is he, he, uh, he disobeyed the Lord and as a result of that, uh, he's depriving other people of being ministered to. And yet, Jesus still ministers to any who come to him. Now, in verse 16, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Now, as I looked at this one verse, and notice how it just stands out there all by itself. You know, you have the leper cleansed in verses 12 through 15, and then you have uh, a paralytic that is healed in verses 17 following. But verse 16 is all by itself. And as I was looking at this, I was thinking, that's something that we could all by ourselves look at. We could take time tonight and look at the prayer life of Jesus Christ. But I chose not to do that, but I will allude to a couple things about that. I want you to notice that Luke seems to casually mention that Jesus prayed alone and he prayed often. When he would pray, it was a time of fellowship. It was a time of fellowship with his Father. In his prayer life, he would be refreshed and strengthened for the tasks that were before him. It's interesting to note that Jesus' prayer life was noted by his apostles. As you read your New Testament, you may note that they never ask him to instruct them concerning performing miracles, and they never walk up to him. You can read your Gospels very carefully, and they never walk up to Jesus and say, Jesus, teach us how to preach. You'll never find anything like that. They didn't walk up to him and say, uh, teach us how to perform miracles. They just went out and did the work of ministry. They never said, Jesus teaches how to preach, and, and I'm guessing that they ought to have done that because these are people who are, who are not rabbis. These are people who are not used to proclamation. They're not used to standing up before crowds. They're not used to doing these kinds of things. And so if I were reading the Bible and it said in a certain point, and, and Simon Peter said to Jesus, teach me how to preach, I would, that would make sense to me. But you want to know something? Read your Gospels. You never find an instance where they ever walk up to Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to perform miracles. Lord, teach us how to preach. But you know what they do say? Lord, teach us how to pray. Now, that's an interesting thing. You find that in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. There was something about Jesus Christ in his prayer life that had been noticed by his disciples. His disciples knew that Jesus would often get up early in the morning and spend time with the Father. You see that throughout the New Testament. In Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 38, in the morning, having risen a long time before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone's looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I've come forth. So he'd rise early and pray. He prayed before he selected the twelve. Luke will tell us that in chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. And he prays, and they notice that. So it was a habit of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would spend time with his Father in fellowship, and it was in prayer that he would receive directions that he might do those things that were pleasing to the Lord, his Father. And that's what it's like with us, guys. That's what I believe God is doing right now in our lives. There are so many opportunities for us as a fellowship to get together and pray. I don't know if you've sensed this. Perhaps you have. Many of you more than likely have already. Some perhaps have not, or maybe you're a visitor and wouldn't have an inkling about this. But I've been sensing the Holy Spirit moving in our fellowship in some really sweet ways. But I don't know how many of you realize or know that every Sunday, first and second and third service, every Sunday, when I come from the back and I walk in here, there's a group of men who are in that back room there praying through the whole service. They get into there, and they're in a circle, and they pray until I close the service in prayer. 
This service, our services are covered by people praying. And I see the Lord move through prayer. I see God answering prayer. I see God doing tremendous things through prayer. If Jesus himself would get up early in the morning and pray, if Jesus Christ had such a prayer life that his disciples would say to him, Lord, teach us to pray. John had disciples who learned to pray. We're your disciples. There's something about your life that we have connected with. Lord, teach us to do that. Well, even so, I think that is something that we can learn from. And so, as it says, he himself often withdrew into the wilderness. He had spent time by himself with his father, and he would pray. Verse 17, now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town in Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then, behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they sought to bring him in and lay him before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. So when he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Now, Jesus is about to heal a man, a man who is paralyzed. Mark tells us that Jesus is in the city of Capernaum. We see here that he is ministering, teaching, and notice in verse 17, in front of religious leaders. Now, these religious leaders who are there are obviously interested in what he has to say, but it would not seem to me that they're interested so that they might observe it themselves. I think that they're interested in order that they might see what this rabbi is saying because they're hearing things that he has been doing and all, and so they want to hear with their own ears. And, and notice with me that they come from every town in Galilee, which is the north, Judea, which is in the south, Jerusalem, which is the key city. And as this is taking place and Jesus is, is there teaching, uh, verse 17 says, the power of the Lord was present to heal them, meaning that God was doing works there. And so what happens as the Lord is teaching is he has an opportunity to show the power that God is working uh, in people's lives. It says in verse 18, behold, again, and it's like an amazement, notice this, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they sought to bring him in and lay him before him. They could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. They went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And so what happens is these four men, according to Mark, the four men, come bring in a friend. As they bring the friend to Jesus Christ, the house that he's ministering in, more than likely Simon Peter's, is too crowded. It's too crowded to allow them access. And so as he's entering into that house, they're trying to enter into that house, there's no way it's going to take place. And so what do they do? Do they say, well, we'll come back some other time. You know, it's too crowded here. Uh, you know, do they get mad saying, oh, it's just too crowded, man. What a bummer. No, what do they do? Well, the houses at that day, uh, many of the homes had uh, rooftops that were flat and they were tiled. And they actually would be used in the warm weather. Uh, and so uh, the family would go up into the top of the... Of the uh, the roof there, there was a song a long time ago about this up on the roof. Anyway, they would go onto the top, and it was hot. They would spend time with the family up there. And so there were some steps on the side of the house. And so they carried this man up. And as they carried the man up on top of the roof, they decided that they were going to do something to get their friend to Jesus Christ. And so what did they do? They began to break up the roof. And as they're tearing up the roof, you can, you can almost imagine for a moment as the Lord Jesus is teaching, 
that he hears the sound and, and in the roof, in, in, the, in the ceiling, there's a, a crack that forms and uh, dust is now starting to, to fall and filter through and, and small openings are beginning to occur and they're ripping it open and you see their fingers as they're ripping it more and more and more until finally they've opened it up enough so that they can begin to lower their friend and as they're beginning to lower their friend, and this man is coming down before the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus takes, takes a, uh, a look at him, and he's about to do something. There's a couple of things that stand out that I'd like to point to you, though, and this is something I think applies. One is this is a man who had friends who cared enough about him to bring him to Jesus Christ. He had friends who cared enough about him to bring him to the one who could do something for him. This was a man who was paralyzed. He could not bring himself and so he had four friends who were willing to bring him. Mark chapter 2, verse 3 says he was carried by four of them. And so one, it's a blessing to have friends because friends bring you to Jesus Christ. Proverbs 18, 24 says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And when you have a friend who wants to bring you to Jesus, not away from him, you've got a real friend. That's how I got saved. I had, a, uh, I had friends who cared enough about me and my life, and they could see that I was crippled in sin. I had friends who cared enough about me to, to bring me to, to Jesus, to at least hear what the message of the gospel has to say. And they didn't give up on me. The first time they took me to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, I was rebellious. I had no desire to hear, none whatsoever. My friends were constantly, one in particular, was constantly saying to me, you need to come with us to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, this small church there in Santa Ana. You have to come, and, and, and I think you'll like it. And, and I would argue with them, and I'd say, no, I don't want to go. I don't need your religion. I don't need your church. And I would argue, and I would tell them, listen, I was raised in the Catholic church. If I want to go to church, I'll go to my own. Why would I go to yours? I have no desire to go to your church. And they were constantly arguing with me and constantly telling me about the Lord and constantly telling me that I didn't know God. And I was angry at them. I didn't like them saying that to me. I thought they were judging me. I thought they were wrong for doing that. I didn't know they loved me enough to tell me the truth. I just thought that they were, that they were just unkind. Why are you telling me things like that? And they say, David, you don't know the Lord. You need a relationship with God. We want to take you to here and, and, and to see what God is doing in people's lives. I can remember that fairly well. That, you've, I've told you this before, and so I'm 20 years old, actually 19. It's during the summer of 1970, before I got saved. I'm 19. My friend Bill says, I want you to go with me to church tonight, and it's a youth night at uh, Calvary Chapel, and I said, I don't want to go. He says, look, it, give me a chance. Just one time, just try it. See if, if you, might, you might appreciate it. And I said, look at Bill, if it'll get you off of my back, I'll go one time. I'll go one time. And, and it was during the hippie time, so, you know, I, I didn't have shoes, and I, I had ripped Levi's and T-shirt, and my hair was shoulder length, and I had granny glasses and big old lamb chop sideburns, and, and I went across the street, and, and I, I drank some beer with some friends, and I smoked some pot, and I went to church. I mean, I thought, man, when I walk in there and they see me and the way that I am, you know, eyes are all bloodshot, my breath smelling like beer, I know that they're just like the church I go to. They're going to get all uptight, and they see I don't have any shoes. They're going to kick me out. And so I can say, you're all the same, all of you Christians, no different than what I'm used to. And I've told you this before, and they bring me in there, and, you know, and I'm loaded, and I've been drinking, and, and I go, and, and there are, you know, it's a place that was built for a couple hundred people, and it's, it's got about 500 people seated in there. The kids were on the aisles, sitting all over, even on the platform. And I get, come walking in there, and they're all hippies. And I'm thinking, man, this place, wow, it feels comfortable to me. And, and then here comes a guy, his name was Lonnie Frisbee, comes out to preach, and I just freak out because he was even freakier than I was. And I thought, whoa, you know, I don't know. I don't trust a church that makes me feel comfortable like this. I felt at home. I felt at home. I thought, these people are not any different than me. But then I... As I listened to the message and I heard the music and they said, do you want to give your heart to Christ? I rejected that message. I said, I'm already a Christian. My friends were saying, go on up. They're asking you to get right with God. And I said, I, I told you I'm already a Christian. I've been drinking, smoking pot, and I'm telling them. I told you I'm already a Christian. 
Because for me, Christianity was more culture than, than spiritual. It was more what I was raised. It was more my family. It was more my history. It's more just the way we are. And why would I want to turn my back on what my mom taught me and what I'd received through training? There's no way that I would do that. But I had good friends because they kept on praying for me. Because they kept on praying for me. And so finally in December, after going through a few, few things and all, once again, they're inviting me to church. And that's the time, December 27th, that's when I went. And that's when I heard the message clearly. And that's when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. That's, I, I thank God for friends. I thank God for friends who bring you to the person who can say what Jesus Christ said. Now, I want you to notice something. This is a paralyzed man. But when Jesus looks at verse 20, he sees something. One, verse 20 says, he saw their faith. That tells me that faith can be obvious. Now, how did he see their faith? He saw their faith in action as they were bringing this man and doing everything they could to present him to Jesus. He saw their faith, but he speaks to the man. And what's he say to the man? Now, this is interesting to me. He says to him, your sins are forgiven you. Now, wait a minute. This guy was crippled. He was paralyzed. You would think that Jesus would have raised him from his sickbed. You would have thought that Jesus would have touched him. And, but you want to know something? He needed something more than healing. He needed forgiveness. He needed something deep within him more than being in perfect health. He needed forgiveness. He needed to be right with God. Jesus saw through his physical and saw his spiritual need. When he says, man, your sins are forgiven, that word forgiven is a Greek word that means to drive away or to do away with. Jesus was driving away his sins, doing away with this man's sins as he says your sins are forgiven. Jesus, in other words, saw something in this man and knew what the man really wanted, needed, and more than likely was praying for. It wasn't so that he might stand up and walk. It was that he might have the guilt that he was living with that, that was evidenced by his being crippled. It was so that he could have his, his sin question answered. What good would it be, guys, to die completely healthy and still go to hell? What this man needed was more than the ability to walk. What this man needed was a forgiveness, a sense of forgiveness in his heart. He needed to have a right relationship with God. He needed to know that the question was answered, and that's the way we are too. We need to know that the sin question is answered. The Bible in Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Lord Jesus, we say, Healing would be great. Forgiveness is better. When I first got saved, I have a friend named George. And I was in the military, and I came home on leave. And I went to Calvary Chapel on leave. I went with George to church. George was kind of like legally, legally blind. He wore thick glasses. He had like uh, 2,200 vision, 2,300 vision. I mean, the boy needs glasses. Now, we're driving together from Norwalk to Costa Mesa. We're taking the 5 freeway, and we're intersecting, intersecting with the Newport. And I notice he doesn't have his glasses on. So I look at him, and I said, George, where's your glasses? I'm thinking he's wearing contacts. And, and I'm telling you, when he's turning on the sweeping curve, the tires are screaming, slow down. He says, man, God healed me. I guess, oh, really? Well, praise God, he healed you, huh? Yeah, God's a healing God. God can do anything he wants. So I figure, yeah, he healed George, praise the Lord. I write him a letter, talk to him, come back on leave. The next time he's got his glasses on again. I said, what happened? He says, I was wrong. He didn't heal me. I'm thinking, man, this guy could have killed me. But <laughs> there are things that we need more than physical healings, guys, and you know what I'm talking about. Again, I've got, I've got, I'm legally blind also, 2,200 or worse. 
and uh, I have to put on my glasses to see my dreams. I mean, I'm really blind. <laughs> and, but you know what? When I, when I got saved, I asked God, would you heal my eyes? I mean, I, 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 would, I would like to go without the discomfort of glasses, you know, because I was always breaking my glasses, always breaking them. I said, I, I would really like it, Lord. And I would pray, and I would claim, and I would do all of that and, and, and put my glasses back on because I, I was never healed. It just didn't happen. I had cavities, and so I'd say, God, in Jesus' name, would you heal my cavities? You know, I hate the dentist, you know, not that they're bad people, but I just don't enjoy the pain. So in Jesus' name, I claim, did you please heal my teeth? And no, I got them all pulled. <laughs> he, he chose not to do that. Um, even though I heard Lonnie Frisbee one time say, you know, God can heal even cavities, and, and that there are stories of, uh, of people who are Christians who had their cavities in their molars have been healed into the shape of a cross. I'm going, oh, how cool is that? And I got plenty, I mean, I could have a whole kinds of crosses in my mouth, Jesus, you know, would you heal them all in Jesus' name? And I was kind of waiting to feel, and nothing ever happened. I ended up getting them all pulled. And I learned a long time ago that there's something more important than getting a physical healing, though, thank God he heals. And that thing that is more important is to be forgiven of your sins. That is the bottom line, guys. It is more important to know that your sins have been forgiven you. And Jesus is looking at this man, and the man has been crippled for some time. His friends have brought him to the Lord. His friends obviously intend for Jesus to touch him and cause him to walk. That's why they brought him. But see, you can have, you can have this attitude that people look at you and they think you've got it all together, that you have no needs, that you're really courageous the way that you are and how you put up with so much and you've got this sunny disposition. But God looks past the facade and straight into the heart. And he knows exactly what you need. And how many times we have had people say, how are you doing? And we're in the midst of the blues or a great sorrow of heart. And what do we say? Oh, man, great, doing good, you know. But you're dealing with something. Well, you know what, Jesus, you weren't able to do that to him. You can't. Jesus looks right past even the need that is present and obvious to everybody, which is a healing. And he says, man, he said, your sins are forgiven you because that's what the man really needed. Now, as he does that, Verse 21, the scribes, which are the experts in the law of Moses, the religious lawyers, and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, they're saying Jesus Christ is claiming the power to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Therefore, this man Jesus is claiming to be God, and, 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 and that they're right. Because Isaiah 43, 25, God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. God says, I'm the one who forgives sins. So they immediately recognize that Jesus is claiming an authority that is really only God's, the ability to forgive sins as Jesus just did. And so they're saying he's blaspheming. Well, verse 22, Jesus perceived their thoughts. And he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Rise up and walk? Well, what would be easy? Well, obviously, both are impossible without God. But to say one is forgiven is easier than to heal someone because how are you going to know somebody is forgiven? There's no obvious thing that shows that. But healing, on the other hand, you see that immediately. But Jesus says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power, and I want you to see this too, by the way, on earth to forgive sins. What do you mean on earth to forgive sins? Listen, now is the time of salvation. Now, while you're alive, your sins can be forgiven you. Jesus will forgive you on earth. But if you die without forgiveness from God, if you die in your sin, you enter into eternity in that condition. And there is no forgiveness of sins once you die. On occasion, people 
have approached me and have said, could you pray for my father? He died. And my first question will be, did he know the Lord? And sometimes they'll say, no. What can I pray for? It's appointed unto men to die once. And after this, the Bible says, judgment. I, I can't pray them into a relationship with God if they died without that relationship. So what do I do? I pray for family members, those who remain alive and mourn and sorrow over the loss of the one whom they love, because they're still alive. They still can be touched. But if I died in sin, I enter into eternity in that condition. So Jesus has the power on earth to forgive sins. But he goes on to say, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And so this demonstrates that by this healing that God has given to Jesus authority to forgive sin. Now the miracle silences his opponents that oppose his claim and the healing produces evidence that his claims are true. There was nothing they could do. They see this man doing that. And so what happens, verse 26, they're amazed. They glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. They were filled with a reverential fear of Jesus Christ. I can understand that, and I guess you could too. If you saw Jesus do something like that, if you saw him do that, if this guy is laying there on a mat and you know that he's been paralyzed in that condition for some time, and Jesus is speaking to you matter-of-factly, this is a conversation, you know, Jesus is speaking matter-of-factly, which is easier? He asked that question. Which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise, take up your mat and walk? It gives him a moment. This is a conversation. It gives him a moment. Let's them think for a moment. Let's it settle in. Picture that for just a moment. If you were inside of a house and, and all of this is taking place, I mean, sometimes it's so sterile and so sanitary when we, when we look at the passage, we, we don't realize what that would have been like if all of a sudden the ceiling burst open and somebody's being lowered down and everybody gets silent and the dust is flying and the dirt and debris is there and the excitement and people are wondering what's going on and the confusion and all. And Jesus is just, just remaining there quietly until all of this takes place. And the man is laying there on the ground looking up at Christ and Jesus is looking back at him. And people are wondering, what's he going to do? What can he say? What is going to happen? The scribes and the Pharisees who are there are more than likely to judge Christ because they want to see what he's doing and what he's saying and they want to make judgment on him. As they're watching this take place, and, and you can almost feel that silence in the air and the expectation, and, and then the silence is broken by Jesus' voice. Man, your sins are forgiven you. And immediately the buzz, it's an internal buzz. And Jesus can see the, their reaction. They're thinking, who is this that forgives sins? Only God can forgive sins. And they're right, because the Bible teaches that. Can you imagine that for a minute? That Jesus Christ is saying, your sins are forgiven you. Imagine that. Imagine what it would have been like. The dust is still settling. The debris is scattered all around. And Jesus is looking down at the man. Nobody else exists in that room for that moment except for him. His eyes are fixed on him. Your sins are forgiven you. And the buzz, the internal buzz starts, and Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise, and take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He turns and says to the man, I say unto you, rise, take up your bed, and walk. What's the guy do? No, I'd, I'd rather lay here. No. He gets up, and he takes the thing that had carried him, and he carries it out of the room. And as he does that, they're amazed. They're looking like, what kind of man is this that forgives sins? What kind of man is this that can cause a man whom we know was paralyzed to have the ability to stand up, to fold up that mat, put it under his arm, and walk out that room? What kind of man is this? 
a man who can even forgive sins. We have seen strange things today. We have seen strange things today. What do you think they did? They walked out saying, that man blows my mind. That man blows my mind. What kind of man is that? The kind of man who can reach out and touch a leper nobody would get within 60 feet of 100 feet of he would reach out and immediately cleanse him a man that can see someone crippled and say rise and walk because the more important thing has taken place I have forgiven your sins what kind of man is this so we who spiritually have leprosy we who spiritually are crippled can actually come to or be brought to the one who can heal us, forgive us, and send us on our way praising the Lord for the great things that he has done. That's Jesus Christ. That's who we worship. That's who we follow because he can forgive sins and he can make you walk.